Good morning, everyone. Y'all awake? I'm not convinced, but we'll see. All right. So as Tanya mentioned, I'm here to talk to you about e and Marketplace and give you some tips and tricks on navigating it with success. Uh, throughout the presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. I'll stop and answer the question. If it's something I'm going to address a little bit later in the presentation, I'll let you know when we get to that point. If you still have questions, please let me know. So first thing I want to start with is the NIGP codes, another acronym. So let's talk about what that acronym stands for. It is the National Institute of Government Purchasing, that's NIGP. They're very similar to the NACE codes you might be familiar with, but it's a different um, coding structure. So for the state of Maryland, we use a five digit code for the NIGP codes. The first three digits, as you see up here, are the NIGP class. That indicates the product or service you sell. The second two digits following, or the last two digits following that, indicate the NIGP class item. That's more specific. So in the example you see up here, the 51, or I'm sorry, 914 is the um, NIGP class, which is construction services by trade. To more specifically identify that code, you're going to see the 68, which indicates the trade is plumbing. So all of our codes work in that manner. One thing that's very important to note. We have a lot of businesses in this room today. Some provide physical products, some perform services. The codes are kind of outlined here. So if you perform a service, your codes will begin with 900 and above for the NIGP class. Below 900, it's gonna be if you provide a physical product. So that might help you narrow down the codes um, when searching. One of the questions you may be asking yourself is, well, why do I need to select these codes? Well, it's very important because the e and Marketplace system is designed to notify businesses when solicitations are entered into the system that match what the business sells. So the way it works is, as a, as a vendor, you select your codes. When you register for e and Marketplace, for those of you who are registered, you might remember selecting your NIGP codes. Well, on the back end of that, the procurement officers use the system to post solicitations. When they post those solicitations, they are entering NIGP codes for the line items that they are purchasing, whether it's a product or a service. When they publish that solicitation, the system automatically emails each and every vendor that's registered for one of those codes in the solicitation. You get an email. Some of you may be familiar with these emails that you receive. So that's how the system works. You select your codes, a procurement officer selects their codes. When they match, you get an email. When do you select your codes? By a show of hands, how many of you are currently registered in email and marketplace? Uh, it looks to be just most, most everyone. Good. So for those of you who are registered, you'll recall selecting codes when you, when you first register. For those of you who are not registered, uh, when you get home today, you'll realize that when you do register later today, today, that you'll select your codes when you register. In addition, you might realize as businesses that sometimes the codes you selected aren't meeting your needs. You might have selected codes that aren't exactly matching your, your business. You might realize that you didn't select all the codes that you should have. You can update your profile anytime. You can select as many codes as you would like. However, keep in mind the more codes you select and add to your profile, it's going to increase the number of emails you receive. So you want to make sure when selecting your codes, you are only selecting codes that are relevant to your business. You don't want to be getting 50 emails a day to have to, to, have to go through and realize 49 of them aren't relevant. However, if you do find that, you can always go through and delete those codes. But just keep in mind, the selection process for the codes is something you want to take time to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about selecting the codes. All right, so for those of you who are already registered, which is the majority of you in the room, when you log into your profile, you're going to see something that looks similar to this. All right, in the upper right-hand corner, you, have, you see where I have the uh, blue uh, rectangle around the word seller and seller administrator. Those are the tabs of your profile. You have two basic functions. You sell things or you maintain your, your business profile. All right, so the seller administrator tab is the tab we're on right now. What that means is that anything related to your profile, you can go in and change. You can update the commodity codes, the contact information, so forth and so on. 
For this demonstration, I'm going to um, show you the commodity codes. The box in the blue square is the first box you want to click on when you're looking at your commodity codes. The next screen that's going to appear is this screen here. The third option over on the, on the top is where you're going to go to look at your, commodi your actual commodity codes. What you'll see is you'll see two options. You can maintain your commodity codes, which is where we're going to go to look at what you currently have um, to possibly select more codes. The second option over a little bit to your left is to display inactive commodity codes. So if you have inactivated or deleted commodity codes from your profile um, because you didn't think they were working for you, and you decide later on, maybe that code was the right code, you can easily go back, see that code in that inactive list, and then select it and add it back to your profile without having to go through the entire search function again. But for the purposes of today, we're going to look at maintain commodity codes. So once you select that option, this screen will appear. Now this is a profile that has one code selected. All right, so what we want to do is we want to say, well, we have one code, we want to add more codes because I'm not getting any notifications. Um, so first thing I want to show you is the deactivate. So quickly, if you happen to want to deactivate a code, all you do is put a check mark in the box and select deact deactivate selected items. And I don't think this has a, does it have a, oh, it does. It has a laser pointer. Deactivate selected items. So deactivating your codes is as easy as that. However, if you want to add additional codes, you use this next option over here, add additional codes. Once you do that, it's going to bring up the search, the search function. All right, so what you're going to do is you're first going to select your NIGP class. That is the first three digits of that coding structure. Once you pull that drop down box for the NIGP class, which shows over here, what happens is this NIGP class item drop down box populates, so you can then choose the specific class item you want to look at. Or what you'll also see is down here, see 910910, this is the entire list of all of the codes under that class. So you can just go through and check and then add the codes that way. Okay. Once you select, check the codes that you want to add, you click this save button, and now we're going to add 910-14 to our profile. It's as easy as that. All right, so we're going to move on to searching. This is, this, is, this is your bread and butter here. This is what you all want to know. You want to know, how do I find these contracting opportunities? So we're going to get into this. First things first. You have to go to email and marketplace. All right, so for those of you who are not registered, again, your homework for this evening is to get registered. Uh, once you go to the main um, state procurement webpage, so it's actually procurement.maryland.gov, this is the state's uh, main procurement webpage, you will see a link to get you into email or marketplace. Select that link, and it will bring you to the email or marketplace login page. From here, you do have the option to look at some open bids, search for open bids, but I always recommend and I always show vendors the process of searching for bids after logging in. Um, one of the main reasons is, is if, you, if you find a solicitation you're interested in, it allows you to look um, more, more closely at the details and acknowledge that bid so that you receive updates. So for the purposes of today's demonstration, we're going to log in. So what's going to happen is we're going to use our login information to get into the system. And what you're going to see is that same um, tab system that we, we showed you earlier. So we have our seller and our seller administrator tab. Well, now we're trying to do a seller function. We're trying to figure out how to sell our products to the state. So you want to select the seller tab. So with this tab, once you select it, what you're going to see is this little itty bitty icon right here. This little magnifying glass, that is the best kept secret because that is the advanced search function in email and marketplace. That is the easiest way to locate bid opportunities for the vendor community. So select that little itty bitty icon right there and it's going to open up this advanced search box. First thing you're going to see is an option to select a document type. Always select bids. Bids is the only thing that we actually utilize within the system, so select bids. Once you select bids from this drop-down box, it's going to open up this whole array of possibilities. All sorts of ways to search for bid opportunities. 
So we're going to look at a few of them that are specifically important um, and easy to use. We're going to start with the bid number. So when searching for the bid number, you might wonder, well, how in the heck do I know the bid number if, I want to, if I'm looking for opportunities? Well, for those of you who are registered, you'll understand that you receive emails. And for those of you who have received an email, you might realize that there is no link to click on to take you from that email to the solicitation within email marketplace. All right, so the easiest way to get from an email to finding that solicitation in email or marketplace is to search using the bid number. The information in the email will include your bid description, your bid number right there, your bid due date and time, which tells you when that bid is, is due to be entered into the system or, or submitted to the using agency. Um, there's also a little bit of other information down here, some important information, the buyer information. Sometimes if you have questions about the solicitation, you want to know who to contact, it'll be the buyer. But right now we're going to take our mouse and we're going to copy this MDJ number and then we're going to go back into email and marketplace and we're going to paste it right here in this bid number box. We're going to select find it. Oh, and I don't have the results up yet. And it's going to populate those results. Okay, so that's the easiest way to find that bid from an email. Well, if you don't get an email and you're just curious about what other opportunities are out there and you want to perform a search, one of the other search functions is this bid description. This is a very useful tool, but should not be the only search function you use. The bid description searches the bid description that the procurement officer enters. So they get a little box to enter a bid description. Whatever they write in that bid description box is what you have the ability to search. What this box doesn't allow you to do is search the remaining contents of the solicitation. It doesn't allow you to search the uh, attachments that are associated with the solicitation. So it's very limited. So like I said, it can be very useful, but don't rely on it 100%. We're gonna use, but we're gonna show you some tips on how to um, effectively use this right now. First thing, when you're searching a description, you can be vague, construction, or you can be specific as far as roofing. You know, you can search for a truck, kitchen, or uniform. So if we're purchasing something very specific, it might yield these results for you. But if we are, if we're doing a building construction, so we're, we're building a district court. So it'll be a construction project, building Catonsville District Court. That's a description. And you search for uh, masonry work because you do masonry work. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna yield results in that because even though we might need a mason on that job, it's not written into the description because it's such a large job. So just keep in mind that um, this is a trial and error, so use multiple search terms. Um, sometimes we say less is more, so don't, don't be, you know, write a lot of words, maybe stick to a single word or short phrase. The other thing I want to point out is small business reserve. So what we have done, Lisa, myself, and others that work with email and marketplace, is we try to educate the procurement officers to utilize this bid description field to communicate with the vendor community that SBR uh, solicitations are available. So what we've done is we've said, when putting a description in a solicitation, you need to do one of two things. Either write the words small business reserve in the description or use the acronym. We're back to these acronyms again. SBR, small business reserve. So when you're searching for opportunities, maybe you want to see well, what's out there for me as a small business um, reserve company. So type in the acronym SBR and do a search and see what comes up. Or type small business reserve. Perform a search and see what comes up. And that might help you get, uh, gauge what types of opportunities are out there for you. The last search uh, function we're going to look at is the NIGP search function, and we're not going to go into depth into this a lot, only because I showed you how to search for the NIGP codes when selecting your codes for your profile. This is the same exact search function. It's going to have that first drop-down box for NIGP class and then the NIGP class item, but you can use that search to see what types of opportunities are coming up under the um, NIGP codes. This actually might be a good uh, tool for you if you're trying to find out whether or not you want to add a code to your profile. Do a search first to find out what types of opportunities are, are coming up with that code, 
so you can gauge whether or not it's something that you actually provide. Okay. Finally, this is a, an example of what the search results show. Uh, some of the information you see here is obviously the bid number and the description. You're also going to see your bid opening date and time. It is very important to note that there is a time, a specific time associated with the bid opening date. And when we say bid opening, um, that's the due date. That's the date that it is due from the vendors to the, to the procurement office. Um, I can speak for the Department of General Services. Our bids are due online. So you have to submit your bids through email and marketplace. Um, and I'm pointing this out because the system is designed that if you are one second past this time, it will not accept a bid. Um, other, other agencies do accept bids um, through, other, through other means. It's very, very, very important to read the solicitation to find out how that agency wants you to submit your bids. Either way, the bid due date and time is, is going to be relevant for that bid submission. Um, you do see the organization. So this is Department of General Services. It could be um, transportation. It, it could be um, public safety. So whomever is purchasing the product or service will be listed. You will see the purchaser information. And the last thing I want to point out is this status. You see that status says sent. That doesn't really mean a whole lot to you, but I can kind of clarify. Sent simply means that it has been made available to the public. So from the, from the moment the procurement officer hits publish to the moment the procurement officer selects the vendor that's being awarded the contract, that'll be in the sent status. All right? So it, even though it says sent, it might not be open to bids. That bid due date may have passed. So the next status you're going to see after sent, like I said, it's going to be open to the public, and then it's going to be basically awarded. The next status is bid to PO. And what that means is after the entire review process, after the procurement officer went through, decided what vendor is going to be awarded this contract, they then went into the system to send notification to the system saying, vendor XYZ has been awarded. That status will then at that moment change from sent to bid to PO. So those are the two statuses you're going to see. Um, so if you're, you're interested to know what vendor was awarded, once it says bid to PO, you can find out that information. Okay, so Small Business Reserve Certification. Um, we talked about the Small Business Reserve Program. We had mentioned it's in e Maryland Marketplace. So what this is, is it's a program designed to help small businesses uh, compete on contracting opportunities against other small businesses. But to participate, you must be certified. There are um, qualification criteria. Um, however, it is a self-certification process. So basically, you are determining um, if you meet these qualification criteria, and then you go into email and marketplace and you complete that self-certification process. So you can see here, um, the, uh, it's, it's very simple, straightforward. Um, you have to be independent, um, can't be a broker, can't be a subsidiary, so forth and so on. But the important thing to note is the size and the gross sales standards, which are outlined on this chart. Keeping in mind, it is a size or gross sales. You don't have to meet both requirements. So the way this uh, program works today, um, you only have to fall under the threshold of one of these categories. So if you look at the industry that you service, you look at the number of employees that you have, and you look at your gross sales. As long as you fall below one of those thresholds, so for, um, we'll, we'll say, our service industry, as long as you have either less than 100 employees or less than $10 million in gross sales, you qualify for the program. All right. So now we looked at the certification criteria. We want to look at the actual process of getting certified. Um, for those of you who are already uh, registered in email and marketplace, which is the majority of you, you likely did this certification process when you registered. However, it is very important to note that you must recertify annually. So this is going to talk to you a little bit about how to figure out if you need to recertify and how to go about doing that. Again, we're back to the Seller Administrator tab. This is a profile function, so select your Seller Administrator tab. That first screen, again, we're going to maintain organization information. This time, after you select that option, we're going to go all the way over to the right to maintain pro program qualification. The program is the Small Business Reserve Program, so we're looking at that qualification. Once you select that option, you're going to see your certification information up here. What you want to look for is your certification number. If there is no certification number in that box, you are not currently certified. 
It can be fixed, but it just indicates to you that you are not currently certified. And then your renewal date. So if you are certified, this date will show you when you're up for renewal. Right, so you must certify prior to that date to maintain your current certification. If for some reason you let your certification expire and you wanna go back in and recertify, it's not a big deal, it's the same process. The only thing it's going to change is your certification number will be different the next time. But it's very simple. Uh, so when you go to do your recertification, again, you must acknowledge the affidavit. There are three options. You can say no thanks, because or not now, because you're not interested in doing it at that moment. Maybe you're too busy and you want to come back to it. That's fine. As long as you uh, try to do it before that, that uh, expiration date or that renewal date. The next option is I disagree. Keeping in mind, if you select I disagree, you're not, you're not agreeing to the terms, then you will not be prompted to continue through the certification process. The only option that allows you to continue the, through the certification process is the I acknowledge. So once you select that, what's gonna happen is the certification screen is going to appear. All right, this, all, this screen might be very familiar to you. It's very small, you can't see it, so I outlined some of the questions. You will see all of these questions are related to that qualification criteria we reviewed a little bit earlier, with the exception of this veteran question. And we get a lot of questions about this. That is an informational question only. That has no bearing on the results of your certification. You do not have to be a veteran to qualify for the Small Business Reserve Program. It is something just to tell us that you are also a veteran-owned business. Okay, so just keep in mind, don't, don't fear if you are not a veteran-owned business. It's not a, um, a requirement of this program. It's just an informational question that we, we'd like to know. Once you do answer all of the questions, you, you select Submit, you will receive um, a notation right then and there telling you whether or not you are qualified for the program. So you see here it says you meet the criteria. Basically, that is the self-certification process. You are now qualified to participate in small business reserve procurements. I'm not gonna say that there's not another review process if you are awarded, but as of right now, as it stands, you, um, by all intents and purposes, are a uh, certified small business. One thing to look at is when you do recertify, if you do have a current certification, you're gonna initially see that certification in the re under the renewal tab. Um, because your current certification is still active, once that other that current certification expires, this renewal tab will turn into your current certification. So, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because when I went to do this, I recertified, and it didn't show up under my certification, and I'm like, what happened? I did it three times and couldn't figure it out. I realized it was going up under my renewal tab, and then it'll automatically be transferred on that uh, renewal date. So just so if you guys do the same thing as me and look for that certification. It's in there, it's just you have to look under a different tab, okay? And then to answer the other question, the renewal date does change. All right, so that's the certification process in a nutshell. It's very straightforward. Um, I do wanna finish up the presentation um, because the last part is very, very, very important to everyone in this room because it talks about the resources that are available to you to learn um, more about email or marketplace and help you navigate the system. So we're gonna go back to the main procurement webpage that we talked about earlier in the presentation. It's procurement.maryland.gov. And there's a lot of information on this webpage. You can see all these quick links over here um, including links to, that needs to be changed apparently, Lisa. <laughs> um, the former Governor's Office of Minority Affairs, so all of the things that Lisa talked about you can find on their webpage through that link. Um, and then there's some other, some other um, links here too that might be of importance to you. But what I wanna focus on is, first of all, the frequently asked questions. This is a document to help you learn more about e Maryland Marketplace um, and, and how the system works and things of that nature and maybe answer some questions that you have. And the next thing I wanna point, you, point out to you on this page is a little bit further down. Oh, that's a, that, an example of what the document looks like. A little bit further down, these instruction guides. They are so helpful. They walk you through these processes step by step by step using screenshots, using um, tips and, 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 and ex examples and explanations. So if you have questions about eMaryland Marketplace and how to do something, please refer to these instruction guides because they are so helpful in, in allowing vendors to navigate the system and providing a uh, demonstration of how they do that 
um, and it's a document you can pull up on your computer, you can print it out, you can follow it. There's different um, topics. So here's password and login assistance. That's, you know, everybody has a problem logging into a system once in a while. There's some assistance. Um, some of the things we talked about today, understanding commodity service codes. It goes into the NIGP codes that we talked about. A lot of this presentation that I did today was snips of these documents. So you can get more in-depth information by reviewing these instruction guides. And then finally, the help desk. If you encounter problems or you have questions that the instruction guides can't answer, there is a help desk that is available. You can contact them by email or telephone. The information is right on this web website, so you always have access to it. Um, so please use these resources to help you navigate this system. So that's, that ends my presentation. Um, my email address is up here. If you'd like to receive this presentation, um, you can either contact Tanya or myself, and I'd be happy to send it to you. And again, I pulled a lot of this from the instruction guide, so if you want more information about this presentation, refer to the instruction guides. Um, the last, before I take more questions, the last thing I want to do is um, Lisa had mentioned some networking events and functions like that. So the Department of General Services, um, in collaboration with the Maryland Department of Transportation and uh, new this year, the University System of Maryland, we hold an event called the Business Opportunities and Entrepreneurial Training Summit. So this includes um, the Department of General Services, all of the transportation business units, um, and the University System of Maryland. It's combined over $2 billion in contracting opportunities are going to be discussed at this event. If you have not picked up this flyer, okay, <laughs> Denise in the back has copies of this flyer. Check it out. It is a great resource to learn about contracting opportunities through some of the biggest procurement agencies in the state of Maryland. It also offers entrepreneurial training workshops um, in areas such as um, finance opportunities, um, how to submit a winning bid, some, some, some in-depth uh, tips from experts, um, and things of that nature. So if you have not already picked this flyer up, make sure you do so um, and attend this great event because it's, it's certainly a cannot miss event. All right, so I will be around for the um, remainder of the event. If you have any questions, please come see me. Uh, Lisa's here, so if you have any questions for her, uh, we'll be around. So thank you.